to the public symposium on restructuring post-COVID global health governance through global solidarity, the role of G7 and G20. My name is Tomoko Suzuki, Chief Program Officer at the Japan Center for International Exchange, JCIE. Today, I will be the MC for this event. All the speakers today will speak in, in English, but English-Japanese simultaneous interpretation is available. Please choose Nihongo from the translation bottom at the bottom of the Zoom window. First, I would like to introduce Mr. Akio Okara, President and CEO of JCIE, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon from Tokyo. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it is our honor and a pleasure to co-organize this symposium with the University of Tokyo Institute for Future Initi Initiatives, IFI, on the topic of how to restructure post-COVID global health governance through global solidarity and the roles of the G7 and G20. Today's symposium is held in partnership with the JICA Ogata Research Institute. Uh, today, we live in a world that has become very fragmented, but we believe that health is a common global, common global uh, good in which all entities need to collaborate. Uh, today's event has two purposes. One is to launch the policy recommendations which were compiled as a final product of a one-year research project on the international order in Japan's role in the COVID and post-COVID era, conducted by JCIE and IFI, uh, with support from the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The second aim is to explore Japan's role as 2023 G7 host country by having two great experts from the G7 and G20 host countries this year to share the, the ongoing discussions on global health at the T7 and T20 process and to learn from their comments on our recommendations. Uh, we are grateful uh, to have uh, Dr. Ilona Kikbush and uh, Dr. Hasbala Tabrani join us to enlighten us uh, with, uh, with uh, what is going on at the T7 and T20 process. I hope that this event will encourage Japan to collaborate with Germany and Indonesia in utilizing the two uh, G7 and G20 forums effectively to restore global health governance in this fragmented world. I look forward to a very stimulating and informative session. Thanks once again for joining us today. Thank you very much, Okara-san. Now I would like to introduce Professor Hideaki Shiroyama, IFI Director, who is the director of this research project. He will share the key messages from the recommendations. Shiroyama-sensei, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Suzuki-san. Uh, this is Hideaki Shiroyama, the director of the Institute of Future Initiative at the University of Tokyo, uh, which is the co-organizer of the study group on global health governance. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. So based on the, the, the PowerPoint slide, I'd like to share with you about the basic uh, finding uh, of our the research group. Yeah, we have a three point which seems to be important as a background for thinking about the future global health governance reform. The first point is that the, the current infectious disease have become a national security issue. So we have to deal with the securitization. So how to make sure the global solidarity under the current condition, how to make sure the balance uh, between the securitization, which is happening and global solidarity, which is necessary. That, that's very important point. The second point is that under the current uh, the crisis, high income countries deem to have a strong international health regulation core capacity was severely affected by the COVID-19. It means that we have to redefine local capacity uh, for the uh, health security purpose. And also we need to revisit the, uh, the universal health coverage relating to this point. The third point is the, the border control, uh, which is implemented even though uh, there existed the kind of international health regulation and the other regime, which tried to control or restrict the, the, this kind of border control. So what should be the mechanism to think about the balance between the, the border control, which is necessary, 
and uh, the free flow of the people and goods. That's the three major important point. So having those kind of issues in mind, we have reviewed the various policy proposal, which has been discussed in the various report and uh, the, the, the articles and so on. The first point is the governance issue, including the, the recommended the Global Health Threat Council or the Global Health Board. And concerning the financing, we have reviewed the idea of the uh, new a multilateral framework uh, proposed by the G20 high level independent panel. And also we discuss about the issue of the development, procurement and allocation of the medical resources, especially vaccine, and uh, how, how to make sure the kind of the production capacity uh, and uh, increasing the capacity of the low and middle income countries, which seems to be important in addition to the abstract discussion of the intellectual property rights and so on. And relating to that, we also paid attention to the sample sharing and the genomic uh, information sharing issue. And as I mentioned, the balance of the control and uh, uh, the, the, the cross-border movement of the traffic and trade. This, this is another uh, important issue. And finally, how to make sure the implementation of the core capacity and how to define the defined core capacity and how should be uh, examine the, the, the concept and the content of the UHC. The, the, that are the major point uh, we debuted based on the uh, various proposal and uh, um, the article. And based on, based on that, basically we try to propose the five point which seems to be important for the future of the global health governance and also for the, the future of the Japanese policy relating to that. The first recommendation is uh, the necessity for rebuilding the global health governance, the promotion of the multi-layered effort through the ad hoc collaborative initiative. So of course we uh, pay attention to the importance of the global level new institutional potential framework at the UN and other the, the, the forum. But uh, just focusing on that seems not be enough. You know, we need to have a more bottom up um, the, the framework and the perspective to deal with this kind of issue based on the ad hoc and the, the regional and bilateral initiative. We mentioned about the initiative taken by the ASEAN countries, but the Japan also have a potential collaboration with the neighboring countries. So that, that kind of the bottom up uh, and uh, the framework is very important. But that's the point we'd like to emphasize in addition to the kind of the, the global level framework, which is uh, promoted by various reports. So that's the first uh, uh, point which we'd like to emphasize. The concerning the, the finance issue, uh, we emphasize the need for the rebuilding global health finance strategic enhancement or of collaboration with multilateral framework. Now concerning the finance issue, basic issue we try to the emphasize is the, uh, the definition of a concept from the aid to the investment. So the kind of the, the finance to the health sector should be considered as an investment. The kind of a conceptual conversion might be necessary. And based on that, the, the investment should be expanded based on the gap analysis. So we are not pushing for a specific new scheme for the funding, rather than that, based on the, the definition of the idea of the funding you know, into the investment, uh, we should have uh, increased, we should increase the investment. That, that's the very, very basic idea we'd like to we propose in this uh, report. In addition to that, the, for specific Japanese context, uh, we mentioned about the several issues relating to the ODA, the sectoral composition of the ODA. Uh, thinking about that, the ratio of the health is relatively small compared to energy and infrastructure, so it should be restructured. And uh, concerning the ODA for health, the ratio of the multilateral uh, organization is relatively large. And thinking about that, the Japan should think about the kind of the way how to utilize about the multilateral framework, including the human resource development. 
And uh, concerning the content of the, the, the investment and the ODA, the, we should pay more attention to the health system strengthening and also the non-communicable disease. So that's also a very important factor as a background, even for dealing with the, the current infectious disease. That's the second point. The third recommendation is about enhancing system to develop, procure and provide medical resources as a global primary goods. The basic point here is that we should think about the expansion of the, the development and production capacity of the medical resources by the middle and low income countries. And we have to think about the technology transfer, uh, facilitation of the technology transfer by various actors in developed countries. So, so that, that, that's the very important point we like to emphasize. So we should not depend too much on India or to some extent China for providing those kind of the resources to the, the low and middle income countries. That's a very important message. And in addition to that, we mentioned about the, the, the potential redefinition of the scope of the intellectual property right. When you know, the private sector R&D was supported, it's supported by the the public sector, including SEPI. So some co-ownership and so on, you know, some kind of the arrangement should be uh, thought. And uh, in addition, that effective the procurement based on the existing mechanism, that, that, that's also the important part of the recommendation. The first recommendation is about the balancing uh, measures against infectious disease and openness. And relating to that, one major recommendation is the third point, the evaluation of the effect of the each country's measures by WHO and the international network of expert. So it's very hard to say that, uh, you know, that every country should just follow the WHO. You know, each country has its own risk assessment and they try to implement measures. So rather than directly controlling that, what we recommend here is that WHO or international network should have a uh, the examination of the measure taken by each country and how effective those are and so on, those kind of information should be provided to each country and the kind of the indirect and soft uh, control measures should be thought about. That, that's the first point. And concerning the maritime transport uh, issue of which we face because of the, the cruise ship issue of the, Di the Princess Diamond, then we have set up the potential uh, role the, by the flagship state, flag state and the port state, and the, how to make sure the change of the crew. So those kind of the arrangements should be organized basically in the framework of the IHR or the ISM, ISM core uh, of, of the maritime transport. So the, 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 this is the kind of the, the point we raised. And finally, we propose the, the definition of the core capacity of the, the uh, health security and also the, the examination of the, the content of the, the universal health coverage. So, so those kind of the work should be uh, done based on the pilot project. And based on that, that should be the topic in the G7 uh, next year, which will be expected to be held in Japan. And also the, the, those kind of issues should be brought to the high level meeting on UHC in 2023. Now concerning the content, the, the ma major part is the comprehensive uh, health system strengthening. That has two parts. One part is that uh, we defining the core capacity to increase, to include the uh, access dimension of the uh, universal health coverage. That, that's the, the definition of the uh, core capacities. And also the strengthening, the common element between the, the, the core capacity and the, the universal health coverage, the management and leadership capability and so on. So those are the, the concrete element which should be the examined. And also we mentioned about the importance of the, the community in that context, and also the health promotion relating to the NCD, non-communicable disease should be should not be forgotten that it should be part of the uh, capacity building. 
So th th those are the, the major points of the recommendation we made together with the Katsuma Sensei and Suzuki Sensei and the Sakamoto san, which will be comment about give us a comment later. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Shiraima Sensei. Uh, now I would like to move on to the panel discussion. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, have a comments from the distinguished guests. Uh, first. Uh, uh, we will take up comments and questions from the audience in the following panel discussion. So please send them through the Zoom Q&A feature, not chat feature, either English or Japanese is fine. The first speaker is Professor Iona Kikush, co-chair of T7 Task Force on Global Health. She has had a distinguished career with WHO and advisory roles on global health for Germany and EU presidencies. Professor Kikwish, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's delighted to uh, see uh, some of the Japanese colleagues again that uh, we have worked together in the past on many different projects. So thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Actually, just yesterday evening, we had uh, a meeting of our co-chairs group uh, of our uh, T7, and uh, I can reflect some of the issues that uh, we discussed. Um, just uh, for your briefing, uh, we have uh, a list of uh, 15 policy briefs uh, that have been developed by different think tanks. Uh, which uh, we will be able uh, to share at a certain point in time. All of them have recommendations, but it's very interesting to see also where they overlap uh, with uh, some of the issues that you have also raised. Uh, I think uh, two things that are perhaps uh, different are that we also have policy briefs dealing with the politics of global health, and we have a policy brief on democracy and health and one on geopolitics and health. And I will uh, come back to that. But also, aside from all the issues that you've mentioned, governance, financing, equity, uh, all the sharing of intellectual property, research, etc., all of that uh, is, of course, reflected uh, in the policy briefs. But we also felt very strongly about thinking ahead of uh, also including those challenges in global health to global health uh, to our uh, human flourishing that are critical. And so we also have uh, policy briefs on planetary health, on the digital transformation and on human flourishing as such. And that also reflects the fact that um, as a T7 uh, task force, we feel very strongly that uh, the G7 is actually challenged not only uh, to respond to crises as it is now, to respond and continue to act on critical priority issues that have been with us for some time, like universal health coverage, where Japan has been uh, so important, but that the G7 must also show foresight, that it must look ahead, that it must uh, provide input uh, in relation to the other big challenges. And as I've indicated, uh, this is particularly around the issue of health, environment, planetary health, one health. Within that group, we also have antimicrobial resistance, for example, as a silent pandemic. We also did one thing. Uh, we are two chairs, two co-chairs from Germany. We invited a co-chair from the Global South. Uh, we uh, invited uh, the CEO of AMREF, uh, to also provide input that from the very start, and this is also something you have in your recommendations, the collaboration uh, that is necessary between G7 and the other parts of the world. And uh, we will also be discussing our recommendations with a group of leaders uh, from low and middle income countries that will be organized by AMREF we felt it was very, very important uh, to give that message. Let me start with uh, 
the uh, politics and geopolitics dimension, because in our discussion, we uh, said that the discussion around global health governance, about architecture, uh, about ecosystem, depending how one calls it, uh, is often taken in a way as if it existed outside of politics. And of course, particularly the last two years and the difficulties that particularly also the G7 uh, experienced in 2020 has shown us very clearly that uh, this is not uh, possible. We saw at the height of the 2020 uh, COVID crises that we also entered a political crisis. And of course, now with the Ukraine war, we are even more so in a political crisis. And uh, whereas in 2020, we also had a situation where G7 leaders actually stopped talking to each other. Uh, so the very nature of the G7, we are here to talk to each other, uh, was actually destroyed. Uh, we are facing uh, similar issues, probably the G20 more than the G7 at uh, this point in time. So when we had hoped uh, uh, um, that the pandemic could be a game changer to bring us together and actually generate more solidarity, uh, that uh, was not the case. Instead, we had a greater decoupling within global health, but also within the political debate around the pandemic, if that was in the UN General Assembly, the Security Council, and of course, in the World Health Organization. So one of the challenges the G7 and the G20 face right now, we felt very strongly, is that um, they need to repair a wasted global moment. They need to bring in that dialogue format that they have, countries, decisive countries uh, together because we cannot afford uh, to uh, fail again. And uh, we expressed in our discussion that as power is being realigned, uh, our concern is that global health, the pandemic, the lessons learned will be eclipsed by the next push of a global emergency. And uh, even though this war is in Europe, the ramifications are already felt everywhere. And just think of the hunger crises that is probably going to come on top of the COVID crises uh, that uh, poor countries are experiencing. So uh, it is very, very important that the G7, and this is why we have confidence uh, in Japan taking over from Germany, that global health will stay on uh, the agenda and not be eclipsed. So there is already that very general basic principle, Germany and Japan brought global health on the G7 and the G20 agenda. They in a way are the custodians of this and uh, we look to them uh, to uh, ensure that. And I think the challenges for the Japanese presidency uh, will be very big here, also how we balance short-term requirements and longer-term uh, investments. Uh, we have seen, and uh, our group is also discussing that, how we can re-establish trust and solidarity. Here we are very much along the lines uh, of your recommendations. We need to understand investment. We need uh, to uh, overcome fragmentary financing. Uh, we are very concerned about this sleuth of uh, replenishments that is coming into global health now, where everybody is competing for the same pot of ODA money. And as you have indicated, we need to go beyond the ODA model of financing global health. 
We need a totally new system of investment, and that also includes the investment in the World Health Organization. So that is the, the in financial investment, and our task force will surely be going very much in the direction that you have indicated. But we also, and this is something we reinforce, is the political investment. And here we particularly see the political investment, which is linked to financial investment, uh, into uh, the World Health Organization, its strengthening. And we do see that, uh, uh, as Germany has also put it as one of its priorities, that the G7 is a mechanism to strengthen the World Health Organization politically and financially, which is, you know, the World Health Organization is our trust architecture for global health. It is the inclusive organization, and we need to find the right balance between the important political clubs like the G7 and the G20, the new regional organizations that are becoming so important. We saw in the crises how the European Union stepped up leadership in global health, something we did not expect at all. We are seeing Africa uh, coming in in a much uh, more organized joint way through the Europe uh, to the African Union. And you have also indicated in your uh, recommendations how Asian voices, let's think of those countries that were so important in dealing with the pandemic, South Korea, Vietnam, etc., how those voices have a, a larger say, because that interface also relates to the legitimacy of the G7. The G7 has not fulfilled many of its commitments, also short-term financial commitments, and therefore for low and middle income countries to see it as a trusted partner uh, is something that uh, they will uh, need to address. Uh, we also feel, and uh, it is something that you have in your recommendation, that the G7 must move from this focus on individual presidencies where there's actually even a kind of competition. You know, this is my issue. And for my issue, I'm going to uh, suggest a new financing mechanism, a new organization, a new something or other, just to show that we are able to do this, that we created something uh, that uh, we, uh, recommend to uh, the G7 uh, to actually create a longer term compact on global health. That uh, this bringing together of the major donor countries of the major democracies in the world of some of the strongest uh, countries uh, that we have uh, in the present system that they join together in a longer term compact on global health, which links to, I think, the collaborative framework uh, that uh, you have uh, also uh, proposed. So uh, to end, uh, we are, are very keen that there is this continuity, that there is a push against fragmentation in global health, that there is strong support for multilateralism, for common goods uh, that uh, we finance jointly, but uh, in particular, uh, the element of investment, you will know that the German priorities include infrastructure investment. And we are arguing very strongly that this infrastructure includes the pandemic uh, preparedness and response infrastructure, includes monitoring infrastructures, includes primary health care, public health, and universal health coverage. And here the continuity uh, would uh, be uh, absolutely critical. So most of all, our message next to all the details that you will see is we look to Germany and then to Japan to ensure that global health does not get marginalized, that it stays high on the G7 and the G20 agenda, 
that uh, it addresses uh, the present change geopolitical uh, context and uh, that uh, it uh, moves forward at a point in time where the next pandemic uh, and everything that follows uh, from the Ukraine war could pose an existential threat. And uh, for us as a global community, the options seem to be closing if we do not act soon to move together. So a very strong plea from RT7, and uh, you will see a whole range of detailed recommendations that we will also be putting forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kikbush. Uh, the next speaker is Professor Hasbula Tablani. Lead Co Chair of T20 Global Health Security in the COVID-19 Task Force. He was a professor and for, former Dean of the School of Public Health and former Chair of the Center for Health Economics and Policy Studies at the University of Indonesia. He was a key person in reform in healthcare and social security in Indonesia under the Megawati administration. Professor Tabrani, please take the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Uh, or maybe good evening, wherever you are. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to uh, say something in this meeting. Thank you from, for uh, Professor Katsuma uh, for recommendation for this. Uh, Professor Katsuma joined us in the T20. Currently, I'm uh, chairing uh, Task Force 6 of the T20 Indonesia on global health security and COVID. Uh, we are at the beginning of formulating policy brief or concept note, whatever recommendation uh, for the, the world. Learning from the uh, COVID-19, uh, um, we will update. Uh, thanks very much for this. Uh, I think it is a great um, opportunity as Japan will lead the G7 next year and this year will uh, engage also in uh, T20, in G20. Uh, two years ago, Japan uh, led the T20, uh, G20. A um, lot of accumulation, but after the COVID and we realize uh, we, we are united by the COVID basically in the world. It is, uh, it is the COVID that united all of us to think about what uh, will be, as uh, Professor Shiroyama mentioned, global primary, global primary gold or private uh, essential primary care and the gold or people talking to global uh, public health, whatever the names. Uh, basically, what we are um, seeing in this world is the COVID with only two years, about two years um, um, in the world, uh, already um, reducing the global output of about three trillion US dollars. It is huge money and um, affecting more than 90% of the countries in the world. And if we look at the, uh, the original of this COVID, uh, the virus originally coming from uh, China, which is um, middle income countries, I would say, not the um, high income countries. And then um, the new strain coming from India, the Delta variants, creating uh, chaotic, very high mortality all over the world. And then the latest um, variant from South Africa, the Omicron, also creating a huge uh, increase in the uh, incident of COVID. Um, we see that um, in the peak of the COVID-19, about a couple months back, reaching almost three, uh, three and a half million people affected daily. Uh, it is a huge jump from previous uh, top of the uh, Delta variant. So the spread is very, very quick. Uh, because this virus uh, spread human to human. And if we know that currently the transportation allow us to very, very uh, fast move, uh, moving from one area to another area, 
in the future, in the past, probably from Tokyo to Jakarta, it took uh, maybe two weeks to come by by boat, by ship. But now, seven hours. Can you imagine? Million of people uh, with a cheaper transportation can move from one area to another area almost freely. And if a virus or a new um, health risk, it can be virus, it can be bacteria, whatever the new threat. Uh, attached with human to human uh, spread like COVID, it is very uh, strong uh, impact of the economies. Yeah. Well, but uh, pandemic or new pandemic or have race not only uh, spread human to human. It can be uh, like in the past we have uh, uh, bird flu. And can you imagine that uh, annually during winter, summer seasons, million of birds uh, migrate from north to south and so on. If it is happening again someday uh, via this zoonosis, prime bird or other, even cockroach uh, or the air, uh, that will be a very, very strong disaster all over the world. And therefore, it, in uh, my view, uh, it is the time that we have to think about uh, a new global health architecture. This is what we are in Indonesia in the G20 and T20 um, thinking. Uh, what are the uh, ideas? Thanks for our Japanese team, for all of you that you have already created from your report, a lot of options, a lot of opportunities, a lot of consideration. I think that will be uh, um, accumulated with many other ideas. Um, that we also will collect uh, in this year of the G20 Indonesia. And hopefully also you are coming uh, for the G20 next year will also improve uh, all of those uh, ideas to make it uh, realistic. Um, but I think in my view, maybe it is the time that we should not just uh, establish something that was um, new architecture or global public health by having voluntarily uh, participation of countries. I'm thinking maybe we have to establish something more aggressive by mandating all countries uh, contribute to the, the global new fund, for, for example. I'm thinking, for example, uh, maybe every country can contribute uh, even half percent uh, or uh, what, half per mil uh, of the GDP uh, to contribute to the global um, new fund that will establish a kind of global fund for ITF. We already having that. We have a core fact facts, yeah. Uh, but this is more aggressively to prevent, to prepare for this coming. Um, disaster like that, yeah? Uh, this global um, new fund and global public health uh, should be also decentralized. They are centered in the south and the north uh, in some region. So to ensure that if something happening in one area, for example, the Northern Hemisphere, that is a severe uh, because of the climate change, uh, severe uh, cold, yeah? maybe some of the center will not work. We have hub in the Southern hemisphere. They can work and supplement. So that's kind of anticipation that we have to think about it. Uh, we have to re, uh, decentralize the center, the hub of the research, um, human resources and funding that anticipate. Yeah, we anticipate we might have a screening, we might have surveillance, we train uh, human resources that capable to be deployed anytime to respond to any um, assessment very soon. And not to mention data sharing. I think data sharing will be very important. We have to uh, create a, a, a protocol that sharing information on the disaster or potential disaster whether it is biological, might be also chemical or physical disaster, sharing the data uh, that can be read, 
to other countries, if that human to human border control in it is certainly important. And we do have the world now uh, a uniform uh, protocol. For example, uh, our passport can be read all over the world with this um, um, computerized um, system. Uh, so regardless of any uh, countries uh, issuing the passport, uh, we can go to other countries and it can be read. Yeah. Uh, that kind of uh, data, if we do have Indonesia, for example, for this COVID, we develop what we call it Paduli Lindongi, where we enter our um, ID number and then showing how many uh, uh, vaccine we have received, uh, whether we have a test in the last three days of the COVID test, then we can see, oh, you are a high risk or not high risk, and then we, we reject entering mall, for example, or uh, transferring to the airport. So if we can share that all over the world with this uh, new global institution, and people have that kind of um, re, uh, instrument that can share their experience, their risk, that would be a, a good opportunity that we can, um, we can maintain uh, the new world, the new planet health, that everybody will live healthily. We can respond quickly to any threat of the global health security. And therefore, our economy can, uh, cannot be um, interfered again. Uh, imagine if we can uh, pull money, just a uh, half percent of our GDP, for example, we can prevent 3% of GDP loss like uh, in the last two years. So that's what we are thinking, uh, but we have to refine our concept uh, into uh, more detailed action, taking your um, result. This is excellent already. Uh, all of those uh, aspects already considered human resources, political data integration, and so on already you thinking. Hopefully we will uh, submit to our G20 meeting in November in Bali uh, this year. Um, stronger concept. It is not the Indonesian thing, well, con uh, uh, T20 concept, but it is accumulation of all of us working together for our future. I think that's what I'm thinking about it. And we are still collecting um, um, Abstract, if some of you in these participants would like to contribute uh, for our G20, you are welcome. I uh, will give uh, you the access for this. Uh, hopefully we can then um, develop more implementable new uh, global public health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tabrani. Now I would like to move on to the panel discussion. In addition to Professors Kikbush and Tabrani, I would like to invite four Japanese panelists who are members of the research group. Professor Yasushi Katsuma is director of the Global Health Policy Re Institute for Global Health Policy Research at the National Center for Global Health Medicine, NCGM, and serving as a deputy director of this project. He is also co-chair of the T20 Global Health Security and COVID-19 Task Force, and will serve as a moderator of this panel. Professor Kazuto Suzuki is a professor at Graduate School of Public Policy, University of Tokyo, and another deputy director of this project. The third panelist is Dr. Haruka Sakamoto, associate professor at Tokyo Women's Medical University. And the first panelist is Dr. Sayada Makimoto, principal research fellow at the JICA Ogata Research Institute. Professor Katsumura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Suzuki-san, uh, for your kind introduction. I think my challenge is to how to manage time uh, because we have 70 minutes to complete uh, this uh, program. Um, so I think I'm going to speak for maybe two minutes just to give you the background. And then I'm going to ask three Japanese experts to make some response uh, respond to some of the comments made by the two uh, presenters in two or three minutes. And lastly, I'm going to ask uh, Ilona and Professor Tablani to make some final remarks uh, so that we can pass it in the microphone to 
back to uh, Professor Shroyama. And I, I'm going to spend about two minutes just to uh, explain why we are here. Uh, first, um, uh, first of all, Japan is going to host the G7 summit in 2023. We still have more than one year, uh, but uh, we are now getting ready uh, to make some um, continue our dialogues. And of course, that's why we invited the T7, uh, Ilona Kikbush, who uh, chairs the T7 Global Health Task Force, and Professor Tablani, uh, who chairs the G7, uh, T7 uh, Global Health Task Force, uh, so that uh, we can you know, have some common understanding about what to be discussed among these major economies in the, last, in the next two years. And uh, so that's the first reason. Second, uh, let's look back to uh, the historical um, uh, history of Japan, hosting major international conferences in the year 2000. Uh, 22 years ago, Japan hosted the G8 in Kyushu, Okinawa. And of course, that time, our focus was on infectious diseases. And uh, after a few years, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria was established. Eight years later, uh, Japan again hosted the G8, uh, this time in Hokkaido, Toyako, Hokkaido. And uh, the, we kind of shifted the focus on health system strengthening uh, because uh, it looked like that uh, lots of resources used for uh, combating infectious diseases, but uh, what's going on with the health system. And uh, continuing with that discussion in the year 2015, in the Sustainable Development Goals, UHC was included as target 3.8. And in the year 2016, G7 summit in Iseshima, UHC were promoted. And 2019, the first G20 summit to be hosted by Japan in Osaka, um, uh, health financing for UHC was agreed by health ministers and finance ministers. And after a few months later, uh, UN high level meeting on UHC was first uh, convened in New York uh, to discuss UHC strategy. However, after that, we, we now saw that game changer, COVID-19. And now our you know, focus is now back to infectious diseases. Of course, that uh, deserves attention. Uh, I think the question is where we should go next, uh, balancing the discussion, continuous efforts to support particularly low-income countries in their efforts to strengthen UHC, at the same time to be prepared for another pandemic. Uh, so I think that's where we are. And I think it's really important that uh, we have T20, T7, uh, Germany, uh, Indonesia, joining us to discuss uh, what to be discussed in the next three years. It's so, okay, that's the context. And I'd like to ask Professor Suzuki to give us some uh, feedback on the comments made by the two experts. Right. Um, thank you, Kazuma Sensei, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kikbush, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Tablani, uh, for excellent remarks. I'd like to make um, a few comments on the uh, questions from um, my perspective. I'm a political scientist and working on international relations, and one of the big concerns today is the situation in Ukraine. Um, of course, the, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Kikbush has mentioned that this is uh, this is going to be have uh, this is going to have some impact on the discussion at the G7 level, and of course, um, they, but the but the question is, to what extent this situation will change the issues with regard to the global health, and one of the problem I'm concerning is the question of the impact of the economic sanctions because the economic sanctions will create the situation where the number one and number five the the uh, wheat exporting countries are uh, 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 under sanctions or in the in in the battlefield and also the uh, the the question of the uh, uh, sanctions on the energies or the financing to to Russia is going to increase the the prices of the uh, energy so the increase of the commodities like energy you know oil and gas and the wheat uh, and uh, the, those are 
going to have a huge impact on the low and medium uh, income countries. And how do we reestablish, or how do we uh, mitigate the impact of, of such uh, uh, a higher price? Because uh, in 2007, 2008, we have seen these uh, higher uh, prices and which eventually leads to the uh, uh, lot of social upsetting and uh, uh, social um, unease and some of th that led to the some uh, so-called the um, Arab Spring, which in some cases led to the civil war. So um, how do G7 and G20 is going to deal with this uh, question with regard to the, um, the to the increase of prices and how the, these are going to impact on the on, on the universal uh, health coverage. And the other issue with regard to that is the uh, key question of the solidarity. I think one of the key concept of the global health is to make sure that you know all the uh, high and medium income countries um, express the solidarity with the uh, low and medium size uh, medium income countries and uh, one of the uh, silver lining is the uh, uh, recovery from covid but at the same time there are a lot of issues with with regard to the technology technological co uh, cooperation, because I, I think this would have an impact on the development of the um, vaccines, development of the therapeutics. And, you know, these are the things that may have some impact because of the um, uh, uh, economic sanction. So I would like to have the both of you to 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 give your um, sort of views on how these issues with regard to uh, the imp how to mitigate the impact of the uh, current situation in Ukraine. I'll stop here. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor Sakamoto, uh, make it very brief, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, so first, I uh, thank you very much for the Professor Kikbush for uh, sharing a very comprehensive comment on the global health governance. So I understand there has been a lot of discussion about the global health governance, especially since after the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And at this time also, uh, so there are still many challenges. The role of the G7, G20, and the WHO is not very important. So I have like, one quick question. So how do you think think the uh, solidarity of the G7 actually was uh, during this COVID-19, especially in the situation where it is difficult for the most G7 countries to provide assistance to other countries due to the spread of the infectious diseases, even among the G7 countries. So I believe that the G7 has been promoting the global health agenda in the past, but when actual crisis happen at the global level, and then the G7 countries does not have the uh, adequate capacity to dealing with the global pandemic. Do you think, are there any lessons learned from the pandemic this time for the future law of the G7? And then the uh, next for the uh, Professor Tabulani, thank you very much for sharing the uh, very interesting idea for the creating such a new global health mechanisms. And then I have the one questions about the private sector engagement. So in your remarks, are you emphasizes the importance of the uh, more strong obligation for the nation state? And then yeah, I fully agree that point, but at the same time, I believe that the COVID-19 this time reveals the importance of the uh, private sector engagement, including the mobilizing the private sector resources, financial resources. So based on the uh, lessons learned from the COVID-19, how do you think about the engagement of the private sector, including the mobilizing the private sector funds? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And from JICA Ogata Research Institute, I'd like to invite uh, Makimoto-san to make a few comments. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kakuma. Okay, please go ahead. I think the microphone is not on. Ah, yes. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Irona Kikubush. And um, I have a, a very short uh, question. Uh, Japan has put emphasis on the concept of human security in this development assistance. 
And in February this year, UNDP published a special report on human security. And JICA, uh, Ogata Research Institute, my institute, also uh, published its first flag report for human security today, this month. And uh, to uh, strengthen the solidarity, and how do you think uh, Japan should position human security in the uh, G7 uh, summit in the next year? And Dr. Tabzani, uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, I, I echo your proposal to have hubs in each region uh, observing the leadership of AU and African CDC in COVID-19. Uh, they have a very strong leadership and uh, uh, support uh, to, the, to their countries. And I think it, it is uh, very important that you include the importance of human resource development in, in the proposal as well. Uh, because uh, JICA feel uh, that human, uh, human resource is uh, one of the critical issue uh, in the pandemic response. The, I'd like to know your thoughts on the role of bilateral cooperation institution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, we are receiving quite a few questions uh, from the audience. And I'd like to uh, just highlight a few uh, points. As Professor Suzuki said that um, the situation in Europe is really changing our mindset. And uh, of course, migrant health is an important issue uh, to be discussed. And uh, how can we in integrate the component into a proposal is a big uh, question. And of course, uh, at the UN, the Global Compact for Refugees uh, has been uh, endorsed and I think we will probably need to discuss that. And the next point is that one question from the audience is about One Health. Uh, we are just talking about human health now, but of course, um, yeah, you know, we have to take care of the animal health if we want to prevent uh, future uh, 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 emerging infectious diseases. I think uh, it's really important to have a, a kind of a One Health approach or planetary health approach, uh, although we are too much focused on human health. So I think these two points from the audience can be something relevant to, for our uh, guests from the T20 and T5, T7. So I'd like to give the microphone back to Professor Tabrani and to respond to, not to the all the comments, but just a few of them because yeah. we are limited by time and maybe in two, three minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Katsuma. I just very quick because of the time. Um, Regarding the uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, certainly there will be an impact, but we don't know at this time to what extent this impact on the economic. Uh, certainly economic migrant health is a big problem, but it is in my view, relatively small problem compared to the pandemic uh, yeah, affecting relatively small. It can be locally uh, managed. Uh, question from uh, Shakamoto is about the private sector. We know that private sector is good in efficiency. It's good in producing something, but a private sector is not good in equitable um, distribution of things, uh, meeting all people need. And therefore we need a global uh, uh, institution responsible for finance. For example, in terms of uh, property right, yes, uh, they have property right, but what if we finance this private sector to do research and then the result, because it's publicly funded by this global fund, it should be a, a no property right given. And therefore countries, for example, a new vaccine developed or a new diagnosis, uh, and then it becomes global public goods. Every country will have a capability uh, going to the McKinto question about human resources. This public, um, new public institution should also train human resources in all uh, regions in our order to uh, make sure that something problem technologically, uh, new development can be uh, produced uh, locally. By doing that, I think we can uh, harmonize um, um, the currently still a huge gap. For example, the vaccine COVID, uh, only 8% of the people in uh, Africa receiving it, while in developed countries, more than 75%. Yeah, then we have to put, fill the gap. The private sector uh, can be contractor of this public. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Ilona, good to have you. <laughs> yeah, hello. Uh, 
Uh, just some very short comments. Uh, I do think, uh, as I already indicated uh, in relation to Dr. Suzuki's comment, uh, we are very worried that, uh, at least uh, as we see right now, the focus on the Ukraine war will make it more difficult to keep global health on the agenda, also in relation to financing, because the G7 countries, or at least a significant group of them, are going to be uh, uh, very challenged in terms of dealing, for example, with the migration uh, issue uh, within their own borders. And that relates to the migration compact, because uh, just as we saw vaccine inequity and vaccine nationalism, uh, we might now be experiencing uh, that the world has two types of refugees, two types of migrants, those within Europe that Europe takes care of itself, and those outside of Europe that nobody takes care of. So there's an enormous equity issue that uh, arises here uh, that we will uh, need to be looking at. I think it's interesting politically because uh, we also are discussing the role of regional bodies and regional organizations. And as uh, we heard from the Indonesian colleagues, uh, the need to sort of decentralize global health, if I, I can call it that, that of course this crisis has also led to a much greater cooperation uh, between uh, European Union and between NATO countries. And we have to see how that also reflects itself in the discussions around global health in the G7 and the G20, particularly because, and this relates to the other question, there was a significant lack of solidarity uh, in uh, 2020 uh, towards low and middle income countries, despite financing Act A, supporting COVAX, et cetera, we just heard, you know, that 8% figure. Uh, so that is why there is this strong push for a new set of rules and responsibilities, which are symbolized, if I can call it that, uh, in the call for a pandemic, uh, pandemic treaty. Uh, I think actually uh, the human security concept is becoming more and more important, uh, just like the universal health coverage, it needs innovation uh, because universal health coverage is changing, digital transformation, uh, the neglect of public health within universal health coverage. So there is also this innovation challenge and that's where the UNDP report is so interesting uh, around human security. And this is where issues like environmental health, one health, uh, planetary health will need to be part of the human security concept. And that's what we meant with the foresight dimension. If I can just have one last comment, uh, we all agree that uh, financing of global health and financing of pandemic preparedness and response is not working. Uh, from our T7 discussions, we are skeptical uh, to establish uh, new types of funds totally separate from the World Health Organization. And so for us, the interface of any new funding mechanism with the funding and the assessed contributions to the WHO at various levels, because of course the WHO is also decentralized with six regional offices, and country offices is something that will be very important. If we construct, this is our view in the T7, something that is again uh, a parallel infrastructure uh, that is not governed uh, in an inclusive manner. And this is one of the reasons the recent financing suggestions of the G20 did not move forward because the developing, many developing countries said uh, this, and the European Union said this is too separate at the World Bank from the WHO. And I must tell you quite honestly, if we look how WHO is challenged right now uh, to respond uh, to the global pandemic and some a uh, lot of other things going on, plus the Ukraine uh, war implications, 
and has to fundraise for every single dollar uh, to move forward because countries have not put money into the contingency fund. I think any model for new financing and financing of global public goods needs to include a new responsibility of member states to support their organization. And we feel it is a scandal that at the executive board, uh, the countries did not agree uh, to increase the SS contributions of WHO. You know, Germany is at the forefront of this, and we hope that in the G7, the discussion will be taken up again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really thank all the panelists for their valuable contribution to the discussion. And I'm very sorry that we didn't have enough time uh, to continue our discussion, but I hope this is just uh, at the beginning. We are just at the beginning of our dialogues. And uh, in the next few years uh, through the G7 and G20, we will have plenty of opportunities to exchange our views on this. So thank you very much uh, for your contribution. And I'd like to give the microphone back to Professor uh, Shiroyama. Yeah, thank you very much for valuable uh, the comment and also the very uh, important and lively uh, discussion. I think that uh, we can recognize the kind of the uh, shared understanding of the issue and how to make sure the solidarity under the condition of the securitization, uh, geopolitical conflict, that that's very important. That's not easy. It's not just an issue of setting up one new institution or something like that. We have to have a more, how to say, the holistic approach, bottom-up approach to deal with that. And the regional uh, governance is one of the elements which can be included in the, uh, the idea. And also I, I like the Professor Kikpush idea of the long-term compact, you know, it's not the, the not just the issue of the new institution, but more how to make sure the habit of collaborating together among the diverse stakeholders. That, that, that seems to be the challenge. So that, that is confirmed through the discussion, I think. But on the other hand, also, the, there are many issues which have to be discussed, which is not, not necessarily outside, but which we didn't deal with so much, including the relationship with the a climate issue and the digital transformation and the One Health issue and so on. That, that element, I think we, we should also uh, incorporate in the, the framework in preparation for, for the G7, which will be held next year. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very active input and the collaboration. And uh, this is just the beginning, as Katsuma sensei mentioned, that uh, we'd like to organize this kind of the, the dialogue uh, in the uh, following months so that uh, uh, we can play potentially some role expanditly <laughs> in the very important transition period. Uh, I'd like to thank all the, the commentator and the panelists and the participants again. And uh, we'd like to close this uh, the symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have thank a good you. day. Thank you very we, much. Uh, we need to talk thank more. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.